Uh, my name is Jason Weathersby. I work for Actuate, and I'm uh, on the BERT PMC, the Eclipse BERT project, which BERT stands for Business Intelligence and Reporting Tools. So I'm, what I'm going to do is a, an agenda. I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of what BERT is. Then I'm going to do a uh, talk about connecting to Mongo, connecting through to Hadoop through Hive, and I'm going to talk about connecting to Cassandra. Um, I'm not certain if those are the ones you guys are using right now, but those appear to be the, the hot ones. And then if we have time, which I highly doubt we will, considering we're starting 15 minutes late, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get through some of the new features that we just added. Okay? Sound good? All right. So first things first, um, the Eclipse Burke project really is made up of three engines, a design engine, a report engine, and a chart engine. And what these engines do are the design engine, we produce an XML-based report design. This XML-based uh, report design defines every, it is defined in a GUI, and the design engine API creates these XML uh, designs. They instruct the engine when it's in, uh, running the reports to connect to certain data sources and map them out. Okay, and, 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 and visualize them in, certain, in some certain fashion. Then we have the chart engine, which is integrated into both of those environments that produces charts that are based on EMF. And there, right now we have 14 main chart types, but many, many subtypes. And what they're stored as is EMF files inside of our XML document for this, our report design. Um, all three of the engines can be ran inside or outside of OSGI. The Burke project has two runtime downloads. You can get either one of them, which one of them is a POJO-based runtime, just add the libraries. The other one is an OSGI-based runtime where you're setting up an OSGI environment to, to, run, to run all the engines in. Now, as core products on top of those, BERT supplies a report designer, a chart builder, and an example viewer. The, uh, the report designer is an Eclipse perspective, and we're going to walk through that real quick. We have a chart builder, which is just a three-tabbed uh, three wizard that allows you to create the EMF chart. That can be used outside of BERT as well. If you have your own standard application, you want to use the chart engine, you can add the GUI to allow people to customize chart engines without even using anything else of BERT. Uh, the example viewer is an AJAX-based Java web app that can be, it comes in two forms. One is a plugin, which is used in the designer to preview reports, and one is a J, uh, Java applicate, web app that you can deploy to uh, any application server. And that, like I said, those, both of those can be executed outside of BERT. One other thing, too, I wanted to note is the chart engine actually produces PNG, JPEG, BMP, SVG. And if you use it outside of BERT, you can also produce PDF, SWT, and swing from it. OK? Can you guys understand me OK? I know my accent's bad. So all right, uh, so here's, an, here's just a screenshot of the BERT designer. And I'm not going to spend too much time because we're going to walk through it. Uh, here's the chart builder. It's a, a three-tabbed uh, three tabbed wizard. Select the chart type, connect the data, format the chart. Okay? And here's our example viewer. It allows me to export to different formats, uh, uh, and I'll show you a couple of those in a minute. Print on server, print on client, um, table of contents, uh, things like that, and pay, uh, pag pagination controls. And by the way, everything I'm showing you here is 100% open source. All right, here's the, pipe, here's the BERT pipeline. As you design a report in BERT, it produces an XML document. This XML document is then piped into the report engine through two phases, a generation phase and a presentation phase. Generation goes and collects all the data, builds all the components, and the presentation phase formats them all. Uh, you optionally can produce an intermediate document called an RPT document. What this document allows you to do is, say you have a very hefty report, say like a big Hadoop file. Right? And you run a re create a report off of that. You don't want to run that query every day of the week, right? You can produce this RPT document and re-render it all month long. So that's why you see the dashed lines going down. And our output formats are HTML, PDF, Word, XLS, PostScript, PowerPoint, and all the open document formats. And in, in virtually everything I'm going to show you today has an extension point allowing you to extend the functionality of BERT as well. And I'll talk about those as we go through them. But in addition, as BERT is running, you, it fires a set of events that, can be, that you can interrupt essentially the processing of the report and change the behavior. Like for example, when a report connects to a data source, maybe you want to change that at runtime from a different uh, uh, location in a database than, than the uh, uh, runtime uh, deployment. Development deployment. You'll obviously have different credentials for your databases, correct? All right, so that's what that, those, those events are set up for. 
This is a, uh, I'm going to do a quick design of walkthrough. I'm going to build this report. And I'll try to, I use this report a lot because it, it, it gives a, a good indication of how the designer works. But, uh, and you'll have to pardon me because I'm going to have to use a cheat sheet, especially considering our lack of time. But, all right, so what I'm going to do, starting off with, is I'm, I already have a BERT project created. I'm going to create a new report. And as I said, BERT's reports are just XML designs. All right, so I'm going to call it Sales Dashboard. Okay. The next thing I can do is I can hit next, and what I'm presented with is a list of templates. A template is nothing more than a starting location for a report. You have things that are already pre-created for you. You as the designer of a BERT report can convert any report into a template and then store that for other people to use. And all it is is it's exactly like a report design with a different header on it. It can be 0% complete report all the way up to a 99% complete report. So if you just want some, some uh, minute change. So I'll start with a blank report. All right, so next thing, the first thing I want to do when I'm dealing with a BERT report is go out and get my data sources. And, data, and the nice thing about BERT reports, they can use multiple data sources and combine that data and visualize that data uh, combined. All right, so I'm going to do a new data source. Uh, right now I've got a list of them I'm showing here. that We have a, 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 a sample database that's available. We have a flat file, TSV, CSV, PSV type data source. We have a Hive data source, and we have two flavors of JDBC. One's a graphical query builder, and one's a textual query builder. And then we have, I got a Mongo DBODA in here, and I'll describe that one later. We also have a scripted data source. A scripted data source allows you to develop a data source either through JavaScript or Java and access anything that has a structure or an API. Okay? And then we have web service and XML data source. Both of those are XPath syntax based that you can go out and pull your data in for those. For this one, I'm just going to do the classic model sample database. All right, do a new data set. Oh, one other quick item on it. So that's my data source. A data set is just a set of rows and columns that are coming back. I can create a joint data set that allows me to join two existing data sets. But in this case, I'm just creating a new data set. And I, I can, and I'm using the, it's essentially the uh, textual JDBC driver. I can call a stored procedure or just write a query. So I'm just going to write a query in this example. And I type really, really fast. That was quick, wasn't it? All right, so if I hit finish, I can now preview the, uh, the results from that uh, operation. There's a feature called property binding that lets me change things like the query, the connection URL, the username, password, all on the fly. Won't show that right now, but just know it's available. All right, so I have my data set created. I'll get into data cubes and that in shortly. Next item I'm going to go to is the palette view. This allows me to have the items that I can drag onto the report canvas. Shows them to me. I got labels that are standard text. I have a, a, a text control which allows me to include formatted HTML, JavaScript, client side that calls it's called uh, client side, and just um, a different formats. You can combine all of those and existing data that comes from your database. The dynamic text is like a clob types. Uh, data, t the data type is the standard data uh, uh, SQL mapping object types. And then I've got image controls, grid controls. A grid control allows me to position things. And I have, table, I have a table, which table and list iterate over a result set. It'll be self-explanatory in a moment. Then we have the chart type and a cross tab. A cross tab is an item you use when you don't know the number of columns you're going to have or the number of rows. It allows it to expand. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is grab a grid and I'm going to drop it in there. I'm going to make it a two by two grid. All right, and what I can do, I can set properties in the properties view down below the, the report canvas. Like in this particular case, I want to set the width to seven inches. All right, and I'm going to drop a chart in this location here, so I want to uh, center it up. So I'm going to put it in the middle. Okay, so let's go grab a chart. I drag a chart into here, and this is the three-tabbed wizard I told you about earlier. I'm going to create a pie chart, make it 2D with depth, and I'm going to set the output type to be PNG. All right, I can inherit data from an existing container. Like, say I have another table, and I want to nest a chart in it. It can use the same data, or I can go directly at the data that I want to get. 
All right, so I'm going to drag product line to my category definition and total revenue to my series definition, or slice definition. And then the third tab allows me to format the chart. So let's do a little bit of formatting. We'll turn a few things off. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I'm going to, one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to explode it. So it splits my pie slices. And now I'm also going to put a, make it a donut chart. So I'm going to cut the center out of it. All right, and then the last thing I'm going to do, well, not last thing, but I'm going to turn the title off, and then I'm going to go to the legend, and I'm going to set the entries for the format for the font size of six, so I can see it all, uh, all on one little square. All right, so that's pretty much all I'm going to do for that chart, and I'm going to drag it out and make it a little bit bigger. Can you guys see the screen okay? Okay. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my table. I could stay in my palette item and, and grab like a table and move it over here. But instead of doing that, I'm going to just grab the data set that I created earlier and just drag it and drop it on the canvas. It automatically creates a table item for me. I want to center the content of it as well. All right. And I'm going to add another column to this table by selecting it and then saying insert column to the left. And I'm going to center up uh, an image right here. I don't know if I can get it. Okay. All right, so I go back to here, and let me grab one other quick item. This is a, an expression. I'll explain that in just a second. Um, I drag, <clears throat> from my palette, I drag an image, drop it into uh, my row. Now, I can pull an image from a URI, a file sh in our shared resource folder, an embedded image, which is just a base 64 encoded image in the document, or a blob type. In this case, I'm going to pull an image out of the shared resource folder. A resource folder shares things like uh, um, uh, JavaScript files, JAR files, images, and, and a thing, uh, an item called report libraries, and I'll explain those in a moment. But I'm going to set it as an expression so it evaluates at runtime. This is a BERT expression. This is the BERT expression builder here. All I'm doing is checking the value and doing up and down, or, or uh, a green check or a red X, based on the values. Okay, so insert that, and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to grab an aggregation control to total up all my values. Right now we have 30 uh, uh, aggregation type functions. You can add to this list with a simple extension point. Drop a plug into your, into your design and runtime environments, and you can add more to it. In this case, I'm going to do a sum, and I'm going to sum the total revenue. And then I'm going to format both of these cells by holding the, uh, the control key down, and we have something called format number, which allows me to format based on locale. I can do a currency. And we'll use a thousand separators, and I'll use a dollar. Okay. <clears throat> and I'll preview this real quick. And this is that viewer I told you about. That's running now. The plug-in itself is running. And hopefully, if I did everything right, we'll get a little bit of a, a chart. I mean, a little bit of a report. All right. Any day now. OK. Can't see that very well. And it's not very well formatted. It doesn't look all that good yet. So let's, let's make it look good. All right. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a border around this grid. All right. And then I'm also going to grab these two cells, and I'm going to merge them. And I'm going to go to drag me a label here, and call it my dashboard. Did I spell that right? Yep. Okay, and I'm going to center that up. All right. Now, the next thing we'll do is if I look at the resource folder, or, oh, well, we'll get to that one in just a second. Um, if I look at the outline view, all this is is a graphical representation of my XML. This is the XML for my report. So that's, all this is is giving me a graphical way to, to dig in and, and select things when report items are close together and things like that. So in this case, we have an item called styles. And in BERT, we use CSS-based styles. So you can style everything. And have it, uh, uh, you change it in your style sheet and automatically uh, rips through all your reports. In, the, in, the, in this particular case, we can use a CSS file that's already existing, import one into the project, or create a new style. In this case, I'm going to import one that I have sitting on my hard drive. And it's called Pastel Blue. 
Now, notice that I got table header, table footer. If it's got a predefined name, it'll automatically apply the style for you. So, for example, I'll select all of these, and it automatically applies the style to my table. Notice it did not do my header, because I didn't pre have a style in there. So, I'm going to select that, and I'm going to apply a style to my special header. So, it applies the style immediately. All right. Let me put a little, uh, one other thing, on tables we have things like sorting, grouping, and, and filtering, and, um, and you also have something like map, a map, what we call a map feature, it means you can convert the number one to January, the number two to February, so you can do a mapping on any, any, any field you want. But in this case, all I want to do is alternate the colors on, a, on the detail row, so I'm going to set a, what, they call, what we call a highlight rule in. Open another BERT expression. I'm going to take the row number and I'm going to mod it with two. That means it'll be uh, even every other uh, row. And if it's equal to zero, uh, uh, there we go, then I'm going to set the background color to white. Okay? So let's preview that a little bit. I'll use a, the little bit bigger viewer. Okay. Got it? And then the last thing I'm going to do real quick in this example is we have something called libraries. You can cut and paste any item you design and push it to a library for reuse. And it's not compiled into the design. It's referenced into the design. Meaning if you have 500 reports with an item in it, a, a header, or a footer, or a, or a chart type that references that library, if you change the library once, anytime those other reports are executed, they automatically pick up the changes which is a very nice feature. But, so in this particular case, I have a bunch, of, a bunch of items in here, but the only one I'm interested in this case is a grid that I've already predefined before coming in here. So I'm going to just drag it and drop it to my canvas. I got a new chart and, and another table. So I'll preview this report. So pretty nice and pretty quick to do. And so if I go back and change any of those items, they'll automatically ripple through. A couple things I didn't show you on here is everything supports drill through. We can do drill through to another report, to another URI. You, we support multiple hyperlinks on charts, so you can add one, two, three, four, whatever, however many hi hyperlinks you want. And you can use the data that, was that the chart gener was used to generate the chart. Okay? Sound good to everybody? All right, so let me get back to the presentation real quick. I'm going to make it Snappy. Okay. All right. Now, so as I said, BERT has many ways to access data sources. We have built-in data sources for the flat file, the hive, all those I showed you. But we have a scripted data source, and I'm going to show you a couple of those. And we have something called Open Data Access. This is a project sponsored by the Data Tools Project. What it allows you to do is define a runtime and a plug-in extension point where you can build your own GUI to access anything. And then you can share that with other, uh, other developers or uh, put it out on BERT Exchange. We have a lot of ODAs up on BERT Exchange currently for different things. I'm going to actually show you one in a moment. So here's a couple examples of data access for big data. Uh, here's a Hive uh, uh, nested uh, subselect query using uh, uh, HQL. And that's currently we have the way we access Hadoop is through HQL and Hive. It's a pretty complex query. Uh, here's the one calling a UDF uh, function from high, the Hive language called get JSON object. So it pulls back a JSON object and then pulls out one attribute, for example. Right? Here's an, another example that's using a regex expression to replace values in the query. And here's one using uh, um, uh, HQL hints. See the map join, the hidden hint for map joins? So that's an example of um, using um, uh, HQL. And here's one that uses a transform statement calling a Python script to handle the map function on the Hadoop side, right? And so all of that's just done in our graphical query editor using HQL. Here's an example of a Cassandra example of accessing uh, Cassandra using a, what we call, I told you earlier, was a scripted data set. All it has is an open method, and I wrote some script that actually imports and does a a query against uh, a Cassandra instance, and then I iterate through the row, rows in a fetch method. Here's a Mongo, uh, MongoDB example 
of uh, using a scripted data source to, and I define an open method to set up the connection, a fetch method to iterate through the results, and it's some very ugly code for parsing a JSON object. But you can obviously call Mongo's uh, Bison uh, classes as well to, to parse it if you wanted to. And then closing at a cursor. Uh, and, and, and someone, uh, we have a contest every year, and this year it's no different. We got one actually starting today, a plug-in contest on Bart Exchange. You can win a new iPad if you develop a plug-in that gets voted highly. And uh, someone vote, uh, submitted this last, our last contest, and it was a Mongo, uh, ODA, MongoDB ODA. You can see they got a little, uh, uh, their own query language for pulling out a particular Mongo object and, and parsing it. It's got a where clause in it and things like that. So let me show you a couple of those real quick. And if I'm lucky, my Hadoop instance will stay up through this whole thing. I have a VMware instance running Hadoop currently. So this particular report, all it does is retrieve some data from uh, um, a World Bank file located in my Hadoop cluster. Come on. Okay. I knew it was going to do this. I knew it was going to do this. All right. Well, I may have to hold on that one. Let me go to the Mongo one. Here's the Mongo ODA example. And in this particular case, you see he's got a function called zips. That's the collection that he's interested in. The three attributes, city, uh, zip, and state, where state equals AL. If I preview that results, I get the, back my information there. I can then preview it in my report and that's, pull that data in that quick. Same report, essentially, but written with a scripted data set. I select the data set, hit the script, ta script tag, and there's my open, fetch, close methods. And you can see I'm importing some files, uh, some packages, connecting to my Mongo instance, telling it what collection I'm interested in, creating my query, and then get, uh, starting a cursor on that with a find. And then on, on my fetch, I'm splitting it up, slicing up the result and, and putting it into my report. All right, and on the Cassandra side, are you from, you guys, does anybody use Cassandra in here? Okay, so this may be not so worthwhile, but uh, uh, you, you access Cassandra data, the best way to access is it through the Hector API. Well, these are a, a couple scripted examples of accessing it through the Hector API. And they have their own language, much like Hive, uh, Hive has its HQL, they have a language called CQL. They also have a JDBC driver that'll plug right into BERT as well, if you want to use that. But their CQL example, Just create, essentially just making a query, select star from user. So, it, and it's very SQL-esque, and, and it's very similar to, to the Hive query language. So I'll preview both of those. Well, it's just the one, because it's the same data. All right, so you get, I got a little chart in there and, and some table data. Okay, um, that's all I'll probably show on that one. I'm gonna see if that World Bank one's, no, it actually came back, imagine that. All right, so the, this is the, um, the uh, World Bank example, if you look, I've just got a simple Hive query in here. Okay, and <clears throat> okay, that's all I'll show on that because I think we're all running out of time. All right, let me, um, do you guys want to see some new features on BERT 4.2 real quick? Okay, let's do that real quick. By the way, we have a detailed walkthrough. Dan O'Connell is going to be doing a detailed walkthrough of the designer tomorrow. What time, Dan? And there's a birds of a feather with, uh, on tomorrow night on showing visualizations. Seven. Seven. Let me show you a couple quick things that we put into the, um, and by the way, if you're interested in uh, 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 participating in the plug-in contest, come by the Burt booth and just fill out a form for us. If, if, and so we at least know you're trying, you, you may be trying something. It's not a commitment by any form of the word though. All right, so a couple things. We, I told you we did this donut chart. Well, you can actually set the depth of the donut chart as well. So it kind of looks like this. Not like that, not blank. Give it a second. <laughs> it's generally a little bit more color involved in BERT reports. Yeah, we just have some leather binders if you want to come back. So you can see we got a nice ringed donut chart. So that was new in 4.2. We support now XLS and XLSX data sources. And this one actually is a multi-sheet data source. So in addition to just going out and getting data from one sheet, there's a property binding feature for 
naming the sheets that you want Bert to go get. So it'll go through multiple sheets in a workbook and pull out the ones you want. And you preview those. And I'll just, most of my styling looks the same, so you probably don't, don't mean that much. We have a, a, a new feature called relative time period. Uh, when you build a cross tab, this is a cross tab report I told you about earlier. You build dimensions and measures. They are displayed in uh, expanding rows and columns. Well, one thing we didn't have previously is an easy way to do trailing periods, leading periods, things like that, right? So in this particular example, I, I wanted to do previous end quarter. So the previous quarter before, what was this value? We have 13 different time-related functions that you can pick and, and use in a, in a BERT report. So let me run this one real quick and let you see what it looks like. Notice how we got amount, quantity, previous quarter. There is none because there was no data beforehand. Quantity to date, that's another uh, function. And then we had uh, previous quarter in the, sec in the second uh, quarter gives me the first ones. And they are cumulative. You see on the quantity to date. So it's adding them up and showing the trailing and leading values, right? Does that make sense? Everybody good to like this. OK. All right, cool. All right. Um, we have a relative file support. You, like if you're using a, 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 an Excel data source, you can either specify that the Excel X spreadsheet is sitting in the resource folder that I told you about earlier, or you can actually specify a relative path in the resource folder or an absolute path to some other location. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else we got here. Recalculate uh, totals. I'm going to run this and, and just explain it to you. Recalculate totals allows me, you can filter out in a table, you can filter out as many rows as you want. But when you do aggregations, the question is, do you want to include those filtered out rows in the aggregation or not? So we have a checkbox in the designer that allows me to either filter them out or leave them in, the, the aggregate function. The aggregate function in this case is a sum that's highlighted in red. Y'all can see it, right? And the same thing goes true for a chart and a cross tab. This is a cross tab example. All of them have filters. Here's a, a chart type. Both of them have different data because we have applied filters to both of them. And if you go to the designer, if I select this table, and then select the filters tab, I can click on it, and there's a look, recalculate totals checkbox. If you check that, it will automatically leave out the filtered rows in your aggregate function. Does that make sense? If you uncheck it, all, even if you filter out a bunch of rows, they'll still be counted as, as part of the aggregation. Okay. Here's another one. Um, BERT cat, when you run a data set, BERT caches that data set, meaning it's uh, not called again. Right? And that's the default behavior. And that really works well in most cases, but I'm going to run a report real quick. And you'll see that I'm, I have a nested table, an outer table and an inner table. The inner table, you'll notice, doesn't change at all. If, it, if the inner table was tied to a, a parameterized query, it would automatically rerun that query every time. Well, there's some cases where the inner table is not going to be parameterized. You'll have some other way of determining what values you want to show in that inner table. So in order to fix that, I, I go into the data set that the inner table is tied to, the child data set in this case, and I go to the advanced features, and there's a feature called needs cache. And right now it's true. I set that to false, and by, uh, by default now, it'll rerun that inner query every time. So you gotta notice I got three different email addresses. That's an inner table that you're seeing there. That makes sense? So it gives you a little control over the caching. All right, let me see. All right, derived cube, measure, cube measures. We didn't used to have this capability, but a data cube is built up by one or more data sets. So if I got a, my finance data coming from Oracle and my HR data coming from uh, MSSQL, I can then pull those both into what we call a cube, which is basically just dimensions and measures. I can display those dimensions and measures in a chart or in a cross tab. But one of the things that we lacked was the capability of creating what we call derived measures, measures based on other measures. Like, for example, we have sum of amounts and a quantity sum. Well, I want to do the average on those two measures together. So now you there's a little checkbox called when you add a new measure to the cube, is it a derived measure? If it's a derived measure, then I, get, I can build an expression. Like this, in this particular case, I'm taking existing measure amount and dividing it by the existing measure quantity for whatever intersection between the dimensions is. 
Does that make sense? Is that muddy as, is that clear as muddy water? So, all right, so I'll, let me preview that one and let you see what that one looks like. So you can see I'm, it's dropping my average price per unit here, and it's even totaling it because Bird has grand totals. Okay? All right, well, I think that's probably all I'm going to show unless there's something specific anybody wants to say. Uh, last thing I do want to, but if you want, most, uh, my blog is burtworld.blogspot.com. If you want to uh, see, I've written up a lot of good examples there. But um, also, uh, visit Bird Exchange. A lot of examples. We'd love for you to register. And uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of traffic in the forums. If you've got Burt questions, I'm on it daily. Uh, and uh, obviously got a lot of good examples there. And last thing, here's the Bird Exchange contest. If you're interested, you can just do it and submit it, or you can come fill out a form, a little card, and state whether you're interested in, in taking, a look, uh, taking a look at the contest. I hope that, has anybody got any questions? No? No? I hope you guys enjoyed the talk, and I thank you for your time.